Good afternoon and welcome to today's IIEA event. A particular welcome to our speaker, <coughs> the Central Bank, Gabriel McLouf. The Governor's talk today, entitled COVID-19 and the Future of Monetary Policy, could hardly be more timely. It is a subject of immense importance given the central, radical and almost unprecedented role central banks have played in managing the economic emergency of the past six months something which in turn has been so important in facilitating governments in their handling of the health emergency. Before handing over to the, the governor, a brief intro. Uh, Gabriel took up his position as governor of the Central Bank of Ireland on September the 1st, 2019. He is a member of the 25 person governing council of the European Central Bank, a member of the European Systemic Risk Board, and is Ireland's alternate governor at the International Monetary Fund. Before joining the Central Bank, Gabriel was secretary to the New Zealand Treasury from 2011 to 2019, and was also the New Zealand government's chief economic and financial advisor. Please note that the entire event today is on the record. Uh, submit your questions via the Q&A function on Zoom at the bottom of the screen, and please identify yourself and, uh, and who your, uh, your affiliation uh, when putting in your question. So with that, uh, thanks again for joining us, Gabriel, and over to you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dan. Kia ora, everybody. Dia um, I, uh, what seems like many, many months ago, uh, in April, in fact, I started a blog, and in my first post, I wrote that COVID-19 would be the main theme that I'd write about over the subsequent few weeks. Uh, back in April, I suspect many of us uh, were hoping that the pandemic would be um, relatively short-lived and uh, we know that things haven't quite uh, uh, turned out that way and as we start to learn to live with the virus I'd like to talk today about the pandemic's impact on the economy and the implications for monetary policy in particular. Uh, the response to the pandemic has had a significant impact on current economic activity and it's increased uncertainty about the future undoubtedly the pandemic will also leave a legacy of structural change, uh, some of which will be an acceleration of trends already in motion, and some of which is uh, as yet unclear, or perhaps even invisible. We are already experiencing changes which would, could have profound and uh, long-lasting implications for the way we live, work, consume, and communicate. Uh, these times of disruption can pose significant challenges, as we all know, but uh, there can also be an impetus for progress. And for policymakers, uh, it's important to adapt to the new world by minimizing the costs of any transition and ensuring that our strategies remain effective. And by coincidence, uh, my ECB Governing Council colleagues and I have embarked on a review of our monetary policy strategy, the first in 17 years. Uh, the environment in which we started the review is, of course, very different to what we're facing today, and I suggest what we're likely to face in the future. But in times of calm and in times of crisis, our mandate remains constant. The maintenance of price stability, and without prejudice to that, um, to support the economic policies of the European Union. And to fulfill our mandate, we need to ensure that our monetary policy measures transmit smoothly across the Euro area as a whole. Uh, this transmission can be impeded by uh, a number of factors, such as uh, risk aversion across national lines, an incomplete banking union, and the absence of fully integrated financial capital and credit markets. And crises can throw uh, these factors into sharp relief and can even alter the framework in which we operate. It means that when making policy decisions, we need to consider our mandate as well as the prevailing macroeconomic and institutional framework and any structural shifts underway in the economy. Our strategy review is an opportunity to take stock of such uh, shifts and how the operating environment might have changed, including as a result of the pandemic. Um, and I mentioned some of these issues back, uh, back in February in a speech in Berlin. For instance, the interplay between monetary and fiscal policies, uh, as outlined in an economic letter we have just published, uh, is always important, but has certainly become more pronounced with the pandemic. 
Uh, moreover, while many structural forces are beyond the control of monetary policy, they nonetheless have a significant role to play in its transmission. Uh, and uh, the, un un the unusual nature of uh, the recent shock certainly raises some interesting questions, such as will the pandemic have lasting effects on the pace and shape of globalization? Have global value chains been irreparably damaged? What does the acceleration in digitalization imply for labor markets, for growth, and for productivity? Will the increase in e-commerce lead to more price flexibility and how well do our measures capture price developments felt by consumers and i want to provide some reflections on these issues today in simple terms the crisis has shone a bright light on globalization's costs and benefits first firms are likely to take greater account of tail risks resulting in supply chains that are more local and robust second the accelerated pace of uh, digitalization will change how we live, work, and spend, and is relevant for the conduct of uh, monetary policy. The pandemic increased remote working and electronic payments, but it reduced in-person services, such as retail and travel, changes that may outlive the virus. At third, as price stability is central, is, is the central bank's primary mandate in the euro area, I want to discuss how the crisis affects inflation and how we measure it. Uh, given the complex web of supply and demand changes, demand effects at play, interpreting the outlook for inflation can be a challenge. And each, each of these trends will have implications for the natural rate of interest, for consumer behavior, and for the structure of the economy. And my colleagues and I are, uh, at the uh, Governing Council are particularly interested in listening to the views of people from all across the Euro area. And there's a portal on the ECB's website, the ECB Listens Portal, which enables people to tell us what price stability means to them, what their economic ex expectations and concerns are, what issues generally matter to them. And I'd encourage everyone to fill out the survey before it closes at the end of October so they can have their voices heard. But let me start uh, with the issue of globalization, an important topic at the Institute of International and European Affairs, and one that I have been interested in for some time. Now, across history, globalization and pandemics have been tightly intertwined. Indeed, the word quarantine derives from the Latin quadriginta and the more recent Italian quaranta, meaning 40, used during the Black Death when ships, their passengers and crew were isolated before going ashore very nature of a quarantine to prevent the spread of a virus restricts the movement of goods and people and inevitably has an impact on the trading of goods and services in an interconnected world. It happened during the 17th century and is no less re resonant today. Perhaps the difference over the centuries is that the rise of global value chains has increased the contagion of any shock in terms of both the extent and pace of interconnectedness. It's clear that over the past few months, the global flow of goods, services, capital, and people interacted with the pandemic and indeed contributed to the spread of COVID-19. Both the pandemic and the ECB strategy review provide an opportunity to consider the question of what we mean by globalization. For me, it's all about interconnectedness. Globalization can be thought of as an interconnected and integrated system across the world rather than just the sum of individuals, firms, and financial markets. Global interconnectedness is reflected in the multidimensional ebbs and flows of goods, services, capital, labor, ideas, and knowledge across national borders. And it offers benefits by allocating efficiency and risk sharing across the world. But as this crisis and other global crises have highlighted, it also increases the potential or the cross-border transmission of shocks. The strategy review provides the ideal opportunity to increase our understanding of globalization and its consequences for our monetary policy. Shifts in globalization are not new phenomena. The first true wave of modern globalization, distinguishing from the activities of the Phoenicians in 1500 BC, or even when they apparently traded uh, with Ireland in the eighth century BC, materialized in the 18th and 19th centuries, emerging from the Industrial Revolution and innovations of transport, such as the steamboat and train networks. 
This is interrupted by the two world wars in, uh, in the 20th century. But the end of World War II, combined with advances in transport, the plane and car in particular, and the fall of the Iron Curtain gave way to another wave of globalization. In the accelerated pay, uh, pace of interconnectedness witnessed over the past couple of decades comprises further waves and reflects a number of key developments. Advances in technology, telecommunications, transport, and most notably the internet itself, reduced the transport costs of goods and services. They also facilitated the increased flow of information across the world. Even less sophisticated inventions that surfaced during the mid 20th century, such as the shipping container, reduced significantly the cost and resources of shipping goods internationally. And these developments combined with financial liberalization and, and innovation increased international economic and financial integration. That would have been inconceivable uh, in the earlier waves of globalization. In the 21st century, of course, uh, one of the most notable economic developments has been the integration of China and its rising prominence in the world economy. Global interconnectedness has been with us for a very long time and uh, in my view is here to stay but the pandemic and mask the fragility of the modern global supply chain just as the financial crisis revealed the susceptibility of the global economy to systemic risk in 2020 trade across the world declined abruptly multinational firms were faced with a supply shock due to factory closures and social distancing constraints and they face a demand shock as mandatory lockdowns occur consumer purchases as we all know and the concentration of china in global value chains combined with the shutdown of its factories created obstacles to its trading partners increased trade protectionism and the tariffs that have emerged in recent years had already led firms and governments to reconsider global supply chains the pandemic has accelerated a revisit of global production processes and uh, supply chains. Global trade and international capital flows matter for monetary policy. And any changes brought on by the pandemic will likewise have an impact on the economic environment in which uh, central banks operate. Greater global interconnectedness increase the importance of international prices relative to domestic prices meaning that inflation became relatively less sensitive to developments in the domestic economy. Moreover, as common shocks propagated over complex value chains and monetary policy frameworks converged, inflation across the world displayed a common factor. These trends altered the relationship between inflation and economic slack as described by the Phillips curve. And while the effects of globalization on inflation can vary across countries and time, it's important it in a framework that allows such key parameters to change over time. Uh, the importance of understanding and forecasting inflation for monetary policy means we also need to understand the feedback loops by which domestic monetary policy decisions affect the global economy and global financial conditions. In short, greater in interconnectedness raises important implications for the monetary policy transmission mechanism the reaction function of the central bank, our policy toolkit, and for the economic and monetary analysis in the context of our two-pillar framework. The international transmission of both our conventional and unconventional monetary policy means we as policymakers need to understand these mechanisms and how they shape the design and impact of our decisions and actions. Now, the second issue I want to uh, touch on is digitalization. In the modern era, it's hard to talk about the future of monetary policy without acknowledging the role of technology. Although perhaps self-evident, it's worth saying that digitalization has implications for labor markets, for productivity, for payments, consumption, price measurement, and in fact, for our entire understanding of economic activity. It's very relevant to the transmission of monetary policy. As all of us will have noted since the pandemic started, technology has mitigated the impact of the crisis by allowing us to more easily work from home, attend seminars with people across the world from our dining room table, and settle transactions without the exchange of physical currency and other things. It seems likely that at least some of the changes in behavior brought on by the pandemic will outlive the virus and will have, uh, and will have implications for the conduct of monetary policy. Even prior to uh, COVID-19, we've seen 
a significant switch towards non-cash payments. Between uh, 2014 and 2018, the number of card payments in Ireland almost doubled from 0.6 billion uh, to 1.1 billion transactions. And the crisis has accelerated this trend. Card transactions used for groceries and perishables increased by 34% on an annual basis between May 2019 and May 2020. And new methods of contact payments are growing in Ireland and around the world. And central banks have to respond to these trends and be ready for change. A switch to di digital payments has a number of implications for monetary policy in particular, where they can uh, lead to a dilution of a central bank's um, control of the money supply and its ability to deliver on its price stability mandate. A recent BIS report indicated that over 80% of uh, survey banks were involved in research uh, on some form of central bank digital currency, including the ECB and the Euro system. Such a currency raises a number of uh, significant issues that go beyond digital payments and could change our understanding of monetary policy, bringing new opportunities to uh, the already rich toolkit that central banks have. I should add, before you worry about all that cash you have under your mattress, that there is no immediate pending switch to such a, uh, a digital currency. As President Lagarde indicated uh, recently, our working assumption is that a digital euro, if it happens, will be a complement and not a substitute for cash. Uh, digitalization has profound implications for labor markets. Technological advancements and increased automation can alter and disrupt labor markets um, with different effects across sectors. Sometimes changes lead to uh, labor substitution and sometimes they can complement labor. The effects of digitalization on productivity are similarly opaque. Uh, and one of the conundrums facing policymakers is why productivity has remained so lackluster in the face of rapid digitalization. New technologies can pose adoption challenges for traditional businesses and can be disrupted, at least in the short run. But it remains to be seen whether they will boost productivity in the future. We need to monitor these developments carefully, uh, in particular from a monetary policy perspective, not least to understand their impact on the Phillips curve. Overall, the pandemic has clearly increased the relevance of digitalization in our lives and some of the changes in labor markets and payments that occurred, that have occurred as a result of the pandemic may outlive uh, the virus and we'll need to take account of them to ensure our monetary policy strategy is fit for purpose. Um, now the primary objective of Euro uh, area monetary policy makers is to maintain price stability, which is defined as annual growth in the harmonized index of consumer prices of below but close to 2% over the medium term. And when there is a shock that moves inflation away from its target, establish the precise nature of the shock so that we can address it appropriately. And for instance, a negative supply shock, uh, which decreases uh, production capacity, will push prices up while a uh, negative demand shock uh, will push prices down. But if the shock is short-lived, uh, the impact on price stability may be limited. And monetary and fiscal policies are effective in addressing demand shocks, but much less so in the case of a supply shock. So overall, it's important to understand whether we're faced with a demand or supply shock and whether it's persistent or transitory. The COVID, uh, the pandemic triggered an exceptionally adverse shock, but it's difficult to categorize it as strictly of one type or another. Uh, some argue that it's a combination of uh, different sectoral demand and supply shocks. They have created different conditions in different sectors. Uh, some sectors, um, such as manufacturing, seem to have mostly suffered from supply constraints whereas uh, transport services were largely affected by reduced demand and both large demand and supply shocks have affected sectors like tourism and uh, restaurants. So uh, demand supply imbalances uh, are sector specific uh, and they've resulted in, in uh, differences in inflation rates for different goods. Data shows that the immediate effect of the pandemic on inflation has been negative. Uh, reflecting that demand side factors played a more important role on aggregate. 
As last week's governing council statement noted, headline inflation is likely to remain negative over the coming months before turning positive again in early 2021. Uh, over the medium to uh, long term, it's not straightforward to disentangle and predict how demand and supply shocks will interact. Even when a supply shock affects some workers more than others, complementarities across sectors can lead to a contraction in demand that is even larger than the original shock. As both demand and supply side factors will continue to impact on inflation, I believe that demand factors will dominate and lead to a fall in prices. Financial markets data corroborate this view. Fears of inflation, weak labor markets, heightened uncertainty, and higher precautionary savings will lead to lower demand for goods and services, which implies that the real natural rate of interest is likely to remain at low levels. And bearing in mind the effect on natural rates and the possibility of long lasting scarring effects from a recession via labor market, credit and uh, expectations channels, the policies introduced by both fiscal and monetary authorities in response to the shock were important and necessary. Uh, a separate but equally important issue is how the pandemic impacts on our ability to measure inflation. While data point to disinflationary effects, uh, we've got to consider several caveats uh, when interpreting uh, re recent uh, inflation figures. Um, as the virus spread, uh, across the world, a number of studies used high frequency financial uh, transaction data to show how consumers change their spending patterns. Many goods and services were simply not available uh, for purchase due to the containment measures. But uh, meanwhile, consumers stocked up on uh, food items, on hand gels and detergents. And as a result, the share of uh, these items in their total expenditure increased in general. Uh, consumers were spending relatively more on essential goods and spending less on goods and services from sectors that were most affected by the containment measures. Uh, so when calculating the overall inflation rate, higher weights are given to those items uh, in the consumer basket uh, that make up a larger share of total consumer expenditure. Um, it's not an issue, I mean, one of the, um, if consumption patterns change significantly within a calendar year, um, as has happened over the last nine months, um, they tend not to be captured by uh, our inflation rate, as the weights aren't updated uh, within the calendar year. It's not unique to a pandemic. Uh, consumption patterns tend to change during economic downturns as consumers switch from more expensive less expensive products. But all this means that the pandemic induced a much stronger shift in consumption patterns than a typical recession and therefore our, our uh, fixed weight consumer price indices have most likely underestimated inflation uh, that's been actually experienced by consumers uh, in the Euro area uh, during um, the period of strict lockdown. Uh, the March to, uh, to May period, inflation rates increase the most for food and non-alcoholic beverages, um, but it declined sharply for transport, um, driven by lower oil prices. Um, so the actual inflation rate that households experience is probably higher than that suggested by our index. Um, and that's one of the factors we're going to have to think about as we uh, look to um, review um, uh, our measurement of inflation as part of the strategy review. Uh, we looked at it uh, in 2003, uh, decided that um, price index we were using was fit for purpose, um, but we're going to uh, look at it uh, again. So let me just conclude now uh, to allow time for questions. Um, I hope there are lots of them. Uh, the pandemic is um, having a substantial impact on all of our lives, which means that it's also having a substantial impact on monetary policy. Uh, the post COVID-19 world could be different in a number of aspects with economies likely facing new structural changes, while changes already underway may accelerate or reverse, all of which will have implications for future monetary policy. 
In order to fulfill our price stability mandate, we must not only closely monitor, but also understand the factors driving inflation dynamics. Although, of course, some structural changes in digitalization and globalization are outside of our control. We also need to understand the effect on monetary policy of the euro area's incomplete banking union and the fragmented nature of its financial capital and credit markets and of its fiscal policy. Uh, on the latter, as my uh, colleague Isabel Schnabel uh, said uh, last week, um, secular trends have changed the interaction between fiscal and monetary policy. And understanding the implications of this interaction for the conduct uh, of monetary policy is one of the many important aspects uh, of the strategy review that I'm looking forward to. But it's also a topic for another day. So I'll end it there, Dan, and uh, very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Lots to digest there. Could I, could I start with maybe an upbeat question? Um, figures out this morning across Europe on how much factories are, are producing shows Ireland's a complete outlier. Our, our manufacturing, our industrial output has grown in double digits uh, over the past year. Most other countries are seeing big falls. Um, any thoughts on why that might be happening? Um, and does it mean, as somebody earlier in the summer suggested, that that shortening of supply chains and greater security of supply uh, may be benefiting Ireland in terms of production moving back from Asia to a place that might be considered more secure in the, in the transatlantic economy? I'm not sure how much uh, production is really moving back from Asia, although clearly there are uh, changes to it. But I think what you, what you are seeing at the moment, and to be honest, a lot of the um, economic data we're seeing now, uh, we've got to keep remembering, as if we ever forget, is that you know we're living in pretty exceptional times and we've just got to be careful uh, uh, about uh, swallows not making this summer, etc. But um, I think what you're seeing in... Uh, there, are two, there are two particular issues, I think, with the Irish uh, outlier uh, point. One, uh, as we know, are the, G the GDP data um, is disproportionately influenced by uh, intellectual property. And so that we've got this GNI star measure that tries to um, uh, correct for that. So some of the comparisons that you see uh, aren't... Uh, like for like. But one of the things that we've noticed, probably from before the pandemic, um, is the resilience of uh, pharmaceutical exports and the resilience of chemical uh, chemicals in you know, uh, as well. And I think what we're seeing is that um, just the con con partly driven by the pandemic, but just the nature of what it is that's being manufactured or what it is that's being exported has been, uh, one is a very important part of, uh, uh, of the Irish economy and of our exports. And that has held up uh, pretty spectacularly um, over, uh, well, over the last nine months. Good. The questions are flooding in now. Could I just ask people when they type in their questions if you could put in your uh, affiliation, which uh, Alan Jukes, the former finance minister, uh, did. Uh, his question is this. The government will tomorrow announce a six to nine month plan for living with COVID. This may lead some firms to seek extended breaks from their banks. Can we be sure that such payment breaks will not be treated as non-performing loans for regulatory or microprudential purposes? Um, there's two, there's two, I mean, I'll answer the question, but I, I do want to come back to the point about a, a nine month plan. Um, uh, one of the things, uh, one of the features of, uh, obviously the last, uh, um, I think I, I, I think I said nine months, uh, a few minutes ago, um, to be honest, it feels like two years, but anyway, since uh, March has been the, um, uh, the availability of payment breaks uh, for uh, uh, households and businesses 
Um, we're going to be publishing data tomorrow that uh, indicates, uh, firstly, the extent of the use of these uh, payment breaks, uh, but secondly, that actually uh, a significant number of people um, have now uh, reverted back to their, um, uh, have left a payment break and have either reverted back to where they were or uh, have entered into a, 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 um, a new arrangement. So the, 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 that will be out tomorrow. I think uh, the world we're moving into now uh, is one where uh, we're probably going, I mean, this has always been possible. It's always been possible for, um, uh, and fundamentally it is up to the lender to decide um, uh, with, with the borrower to decide uh, the extent to which a payment break should or shouldn't be available. Um, I think what we're moving into now is probably a decision point where uh, the, the payment breaks, um, to the extent that uh, businesses or households feel they need to continue, we're probably moving more into a world where we actually, the lender will need to think about restructuring the whole of um, the whole of the uh, uh, of the debt uh, or the loan. Um, now we're going to be, uh, you know, the EBA, uh, of which we, the European Banking Authority, of which we are part of, uh, sets the rules as to what is or what isn't a non-forming loan to make sure that's sort of consistent across uh, the euro area. Um, that's going to be something that we're going to have to think about quite carefully. But as long as this crisis continues, the less uh, possible, uh, in my view, that we can simply postpone um, the, uh, uh, postpone some of those decisions as to whether loans um, are actually uh, borrowings or, or fact businesses, if I can go to the point, are viable or not. Um, because that will determine very much, and it's up to the, I mean, the lenders will be best placed to make those judgments, um, the extent to which uh, some of those uh, loans can continue, uh, the businesses can continue, and therefore their restructuring is worth doing. The, um, and I think that's, that's really the, what the main focus needs to be. And in particular, if I can just say, uh, in Ireland, one of the things that we all need, uh, and this isn't just the central bank, not the regulator and, and the lenders, but I think the whole community needs to be looking to avoid um, what I think is an ongoing problem for us, which is the legacy of um, uh, uh, some of the legacy of the financial crisis, some of the debts uh, that uh, continue. <coughs> Um, and we need to avoid, uh, I mean, there's bound to be, just because of the recession and the impact of the shock, there's bound to be more, um, uh, as we've seen it from the payment breaks, there are people uh, in a distressed debt situation. But we need to avoid that uh, almost becoming a structural problem, which I think we have with some of the legacy debt from, um, uh, from the financial crisis, which is why we are encouraging uh, in line with what the Banking and uh, Payments Federation of Ireland in their recent advertising uh, have been encouraging, is that uh, borrowers uh, engage with their lenders if they feel they're going to have a, um, a longer term problem. But if I can come back, Dan, on this, my, the point about the six to nine month plan, uh, from my perspective, uh, one of the things we... Um, are coming to terms with. I mentioned at the beginning of uh, my speech that uh, in April we all hoped this was going to uh, be short-lived. Uh, we're now having to learn to live with this. My view, uh, and I put my hand up and say I'm not a epidemiologist. I'm not a. Um, I've got no expertise in health uh, sort of issues. But my, from what I observe and read. Um, and uh, what I've absor absorbed, uh, it looks to me that um, the impact of the pandemic is going to uh, be around for a lot of 2021, for a lot of next year. 
Uh, and what I think businesses and households need the most right now is a sense of what is the plan for this longer term period. So they can start to make uh, arrangements, um, try to put some order uh, either in their sort of home lives or in the business decisions they have to make. Um, so if you, if you think about the first few months of the crisis, we, um, we had lots of decisions being made on the basis of new information. We were learning as we were going. Uh, I think we're now reaching a point where uh, we know, well, actually, let me rephrase that. It seems to me um, that uh, this virus is not going to be uh, eliminated in the next few months. Um, and uh, we need to learn to live with it as best we can. Uh, we need to, and, and living with it means that economic activity needs to continue as best it can. The more that uh, households and businesses can be given time to uh, plan, uh, so the more that there is a long-term plan, they can sort of frame their own decisions around, the better I think it will be for um, for the community at large and for the economy. Um, so I do think this is, uh, it's a pretty important, for me, I think it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty important issue um, and has big implications for how uh, the economy will function over the, uh, over the coming months. Can I just two follow up? Would that suggest that you think a full-scale lockdown is would be inappropriate under any circumstances? Do you have a view on that? And you also mentioned legacy bad loans from the last recession. They had become a structural problem. What did, what did you mean by structural problem? Um, I, I think another uh, lockdown across the whole country would have very serious implications for uh, the economy and uh, for the community at large. Um, do I think it would be inappropriate under any circumstances? Of course not. I'm not a, I'm not a health person. So uh, I leave those judgments uh, to them. But um, as I said, I do think that uh, if, we, if we were certain we could eliminate this virus and we were certain on the time scale, then perhaps by, by full lockdown, then perhaps that's what we should be doing. But uh, my observation is that that's highly unlikely. Uh, so I think it's better if we're going to have to live with it, that the economy does continue to work and that we do uh, give ourselves as, as much of a framework on which to make decisions. Uh, hence, uh, the, the more, I mean, you know, if, I mean, I don't know what the government is going to come out with, but uh, the longer the plan, longer the time scale of the plan, I think the better for everybody. A very important moment in this, you know, in, so what, what I'm saying is we want more certainty than we've had. And I think a very, very important moment in uh, giving people that sense of certainty, albeit, you know, in extraordinary circumstances, is, is the return to school. I think that has helped, uh, and fingers crossed that it actually sort of continues to proceed uh, as smoothly as possible. Um, I think that has helped uh, everybody, households, businesses, um, to start to plan for the future. Uh, what did I mean by structural problems? Well, the reality, uh, Dan, is that there are debts outstanding from the financial crisis. There are, in some cases, um, uh, people, uh, borrowers, who have not engaged with their lender on resolving those arrears. Um, the, the legacy is not helping uh, Ireland. It's not helping the community. It's not helping those individuals. It's not helping the lenders. Uh, it's not helping future borrowers because of the shadow it casts on um, uh, on uh, on the economy as a whole. I mean, one of the reasons, as you know, we've uh, we've said in the past, one of the reasons are interest rates. Not the only reason, by any means, but one of the reasons are mortgage interest rates are slightly higher than they are elsewhere 
in uh, the euro area is because of the legacy of the last crisis. So the more we can sort of, uh, the more we can resolve those issues, and certainly the, uh, making sure that we don't exacerbate uh, those issues, the better I think it'll be for the community as a whole. Thank you. I have two questions here on the same theme. Simon Barry from Ulster Bank and Dermot O'Leary from Good Buddy Stockbrokers both of them point out that the ECB's own inflation forecasts going out in the next couple of years uh, point to an undershooting of the inflation target. Um, Simon asks, is, is um, why are ECB monetary policy settings not more accommodative at present? And Dermot picks up on that point and says, um, are we at risk of falling into a Japan-style long period of lower falling prices? What can ECB learn from the experience of Japan? I think we are, um, we, so my short, I mean, my short answer to that is uh, no. Uh, I think we are, um, still in a world where we're trying to understand uh, exactly the impact of the pandemic and what it will mean for uh, the transmission of monetary policy and, and ultimately uh, uh, inflation. I mean, the reality is that the, uh, as we said last week, we've, um, there's been quite a robust, at one level, quite a robust recovery in uh, the euro area economy, but um, it's uh, it's in particular sectors. Um, it's not across the um, the whole uh, economy, and of course, it's nowhere near uh, returning us to where we were pre-pandemic. So uh, I uh, I think our policy settings are right, um, uh, but uh, we're keeping. Uh, as close an eye as we can, trying to understand as much as we can uh, in, in, in the exceptionally unusual circumstances that we live in. Uh, and we'll make uh, whatever decisions that we need to make to make sure that we deliver on our mandate. One of the things that hasn't come up yet is the um, March, the agreement in March for the pandemic purchase program, the, the use of the central bank balance sheet uh, in a really radical way, has been a huge expansion of central bank balance sheets in, in, in the developed uh, world, including in the Eurozone. Um, much of that has gone to purchasing uh, sovereign bonds. Um, how long do you foresee the pandemic uh, purchase program continuing and how important has it been? Um, has it influenced consumer prices? How important has it been in influencing asset prices? Well, it's certainly, it's certainly um uh, being a very important um, uh, part of the response to the uh, pandemic shock, and uh, um, which is why we have, uh, from when we made the decision to launch the P the PEP program in on the 18th of March, uh, we subsequently increased it as well. It was having an effect, and we decided we needed to have a bigger effect. Um, so uh, it's working, uh, and we've at this stage, uh, the program will run till the middle of next year. Um, when we come to look at uh, the data again uh, later on this year, we'll make, you know, as we always do, we look and decide, you know, what are the numbers telling us? What actions do we need to take? Um, and do they need to be different at all? I mean, overall, we're aiming to deliver on our price stability mandate, and uh, that's our focus. Uh, when we looked at this last week, we decided we didn't need to make any changes. Um, but uh, we didn't make any changes because things are working um, in the uh, and and are in, you know it's been an, as I said it's been an important step, uh, and they are working in the direction that we want them to work. Okay. Um, another uh, Japan-related uh, question here from Niall Burke um, wonders whether the ECB should consider the purchase of exchange-traded funds, uh, such as the Bank of Japan has done. Um, quite a detailed one. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I don't think we need. I mean, we're, we're um, we've got a pretty uh, um, we've got a pretty extensive toolkit. 
And uh, we're also, as we showed at the PEP, we're also prepared to innovate. At the moment, at the moment we're happy with our toolkit uh, and we're happy with the actions that we've taken. So I don't think, um, if we feel we need to do something different um, to deliver on our mandate, we'll do something different. But at the moment, um, uh, we are where we are. And the, 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 the review, when is the review uh, supposed to conclude? The, review? Um, the, uh, the second half of next year. Okay. And do you see any possibility of that being pushed out given the, ex the, the extent of the uncertainty? Well, if you'd said, if you'd, if you'd said to me uh, in February, when was the review going to conclude, I would have said, oh, in, uh, in the first half of 2021, and then something happened. Um, and uh, so who knows? But uh, I, I, I'm quite keen to be honest with you that um, we don't delay it any further for, two, for, for one particular reason, well, two reasons. One, um, dragging these things out um, uh, ultimately does no one any good uh, because we're just going to, you know, we're going to do the work, understand the issues and, and just make a decision on what it means for policy. But secondly, um, uh, my own view, and this is not the view of, uh, I, haven't, I don't know what my colleagues on the council, uh, governing council think, but my own view is that we need to move to a world where we're actually doing a strategy review uh, much more often. I, I personally, I think every five years uh, we should do a strategy review. It should be, it should be a bit more of a business as usual sort of process, um, as opposed to doing one every 17 years. So um, if you have an every five year approach, then actually delaying it much more uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. The last review was almost two decades ago. Well, exactly. I mean, I suspect that if it wasn't for financial crisis, they may have looked at the review, you know, looked at the strategy um, uh, in the meantime, but I don't know. But uh, yeah, the last review was in 2003. A no, bear, bear in mind, bear in mind that the uh, the euro started in 1999. It was reviewed, you know, sort of the, the strategy was reviewed a few years after that, and it's been a long time since we've looked at it again. Uh, FinTech question from Joseph O'Hanlon from Comreg. Let me read it. With increasing digitalization, shouldn't the CBI expand its innovation hub? and develop a full-scale regulatory sandbox like the UK Financial uh, Conduct Authority has. The F, the, that, that UK sandbox grants waivers and no action letters that the Europe, Europe Central Bank's Innovation Hub does not currently do. Um, again, quite a technical one. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, I, I, um, I'm not sure whether I'd copy what the UK are doing, um, but uh, I do think that... Um, I do want the innovation, our innovation hub, uh, to um, play a uh, as big a role as it can um, uh, with the resources that we can devote to it. But uh, play as big a role as it can uh, to the development of um, uh, fintech, if you want to use that word, uh, not just in Ireland but as part of the euro system. So the euro system has. Um, is participating in the BIS has set up an innovation hub which has a number of centers uh, around the world. Uh, the Eurosystem itself has set up a center uh, uh, as part, sorry, one of the BIS's uh, centers um, is a Eurosystem center based in, in, in uh, I think, Paris and Frankfurt, uh, France and Germany anyway, Paris and Frankfurt. Um, we in Ireland are part of a small group of uh, ECB countries who are inputting into that innovation hub at the Eurosystem level. So I, you know, the, the general sort of answer to the question is that uh, this is the future. Completely agree. This is the future, um, and uh, we want to be uh, we want to be part of the future. But whether we're going to do what the UK is doing, um, I'm, I'm not sure.
Okay, great. Uh, another one from industry, Pat, Pat Lardner from the Irish Funds uh, Group representative of the body. Um, your speech made reference to the transmission mechanism, uh, monetary policy transmission mechanism, both conventional and unconventional. Um, how is the data set which the ECB and other policymakers use expanded to understand the impacts of uh, this, this broader um, uh, conventional and unconventional uh, policy measures? Well, um, I, uh, to a certain extent, that is also a technical question, but uh, the data set has been expanding, and one of the um, um, one of the things that uh, the ECB has been looking at is uh, making sure it, it has the broadest possible information set, this data set, uh, to understand the impacts of, um, of both monetary policy and unconventional monetary, monetary policy. I mean, I talked about um, uh, our measurement of inflation. I mean, the other thing we're interested in is the flow the flows uh, uh, of um, of funds across uh, across the system, um, uh, not least uh, in uh, in funds and in non banks, uh, which, as some of you will know, I'm very interested in uh, understanding better. But um, I uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure I can add much more to Pat's question at a technical level, but. The uh, monetary policy, at the end of the day, uh, is all about interpreting data and uh, communicating uh, our analysis of it well. Yeah, and in, in fairness, there does seem to be a, a greater use of the high-frequency data, card payment data on a daily basis compared to the same day the previous year, um, search engine mobility data, all of that is sort of helping us um, to helping us get a feel for what's happening with, with certainly the wider economy. Um, can I give you a question on climate from Luca Callahan, one of, one of my colleagues here. Um, how is the bank managing its role to help build a climate resilient financial system when the response of the pandemic has taken up so much time? Does the and does the bank have any intentions to run a stress test on the financial stability impacts of climate change? We haven't made decisions on that uh, yet, but um, last, uh, the end of last year, or maybe the beginning of this year, um, we uh, uh, announced that we were uh, creating, we announced internally, uh, that we were going to create a new division that was going to focus on climate change. Um, so we were adding, I mean, that's not to say we weren't uh, studying climate change uh, before that, um, but we decided that um, we were going to give it extra focus um, by creating uh, uh, a structure around that. Um, uh, and then the pandemic hit and we had to reprioritize. Um, so a lot of the work that we uh, would have wanted to do uh, during the course of 2020 has had to be delayed. But, um, uh, but our uh, objective hasn't changed. Um, and it is one of those things which I, uh, um, as I've signaled before to uh, people, um, a lot of the issues that we faced before the pandemic have not gone away. Um, we, uh, we've had to um, obviously focus on the pandemic and the response to it and to manage the pressures of the immediate. But there are some very big issues that uh, remain. Uh, climate change uh, is one of them, and uh, the central bank, uh, with its uh, partners in uh, Europe, uh, are absolutely going to be focused on understanding uh, the financial stability issues and others, to be honest, uh, because you could see how um, the move to a low carbon uh, world is also going to impact on our understanding of uh, uh, we'll have monetary policy implications because of its impact, potential impact on uh, on energy and energy costs. 
Thanks, Gabriel. So we have, um, we'll, we'll finish with a question on, on, on how the, you and, the, and, and your colleagues view the appropriateness of, um, of the fiscal response. But we've got a couple of questions, predictably enough, on Brexit. Um, uh, Gosh. Peter McLoon, of our, our, one of our board members, has, says, do you have any thoughts on a hard Brexit coming on top of the COVID challenge? And my colleague, Andrew Gilmore, asks um uh, how, how does the um how are you factoring in a hard or a no deal brexit in your planning um uh on issues like fa financial stability for example um if you have thoughts on on impacts of a hard or no deal brexit uh, a big issue and i'll try and uh <clears throat> Uh, well, I'll avoid the uh, the drama of the last week, um, which is obviously part of the whole story. But uh, back in February, I spoke at the uh, European Financial Forum, um, and I, rem I, I remember saying that, you know, the U UK had now left the EU, uh, and that whatever world was going to... Uh, arrive was going to be uh, uh, not as good as the world when the UK was in the EU. And we should start planning for the fact that um, there would be differences and uh, they would not be, um, and they would have an impact on uh, the Irish economy. And we should start, you know, I mean, one of the things I was worried about, to be honest with you, uh, at the time, and to a certain extent I've been worried about for a little while, is that too many people were hoping that the transition period would carry on forever. Uh, that's, it was, my advice has always been uh, start planning for divergence. Um, our uh, quarterly bulletin in July um, has an assumption in it that some sort of uh, free trade agreement will be negotiated between the UK and the EU. Um, but a, a, a trade agreement uh, focused around um, uh, no tariffs, essentially no tariffs and no quotas on goods. Um, we've said before that if that didn't happen, um, there would be a hit of between one and two percent um, on uh, Irish GDP, and uh, I uh, I think we should. It would be wise to plan on the basis uh, that there won't be a deal, um, and that there will be a hit of between one and two percent GDP. We need to look again at our numbers because. Um, that's uh, not uh, up to date, but that's the last time we looked at it. Um, uh, one of the extraordinary things about the, um, in, from my perspective, about the, the whole uh, UK EU economic debate is how much, how little focus has been given um, to services in this. It's a very, very significant part of the UK economy, and it's an important part of Ireland's economy, but a lot of the popular uh, commentary has been about trading in goods, and I suppose it's easier to and more tangible. But uh, from our perspective, where we were before, where we were back in October last year, when I was asked, this is when we had many deadlines uh, that went through 2019 on hard Brexit, um, uh, our position is similar to what it was then, which is we think the financial system as a whole in Ireland is ready for uh, Brexit. Um, we can't say that every single firm uh, itself is ready, but uh, we feel the big ones are ready. Uh, we feel the system as a whole is ready. Um, now, uh, what exactly is going to happen at the end of the day? Um, uh, you know, the last week has uh, just highlighted that um, 
a lot of us don't know what is going on. Um, and there's just a few people who have a sense of what it is that will ultimately be agreed. So um, again, there's the short term uh, implications of all this and there's the medium to longer term implications of all this. Um, what's, for me, what's clear as far as the medium to long term is concerned is that the UK has left the EU. Um, it will, in, in, in economic terms, leave the EU uh, from the 1st of January 2021. We need to be start uh, working um, on uh, the basis that it won't be part of the old system that we knew, and we need to start uh, working uh, to develop uh, with our, the rest of our EU partners a new world, um, and hoping that uh, we can enter into arrangements uh, with the UK that actually support and enable um, uh, both economies uh, to do well. Governor, we've run out of time, so that question on the appropriateness of the fiscal stance will have to wait until the next time. And I hope this was your first time speaking to us at the IIEA, and many thanks for doing so. And we do look forward to, to having you back in person, hopefully, when it's when things are safe and it's able, we're able to do that. I welcome you to, welcome you to North Great Georgia Street. Um, so we, we look forward to and hope that, that that's possible uh, in, the, in, the, in the near future. So on behalf of uh, all my colleagues at the Institute and all our members, thank you for your time today and, and for sharing your thoughts. Thank you, Dan.